On this week in enterprise tech, Verizon has got mail, Microsoft goes under, and Venom causes carnage. Twyet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for this week in enterprise tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyet. This week in enterprise tech, episode 140, recorded May 15th, 2015. Anti Venom. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100-plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidate fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. And by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox, but with IT admin tools that allow you to control and protect your company's information. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyet This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I'm not guiding you by myself. I'm joined by my regular cast of co-host characters. I'll say that five times quickly. Starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, how is the Geek in Paradise? Oh, the Geek in Paradise has little holes in his fingers from playing with wire and all kinds of power. It's, it's all kinds of fun doing power monitoring. That's right. And you had Mini Maker. How did Mini Maker go? Mini Maker, uh, final attendee was 11.05. And so roughly a little less than double from last year and lots and lots of people. And I actually, the Raspberry Pi workshop that I was running uh, was completely full with the same number on the waiting list and people actually sitting on the side just to listen. Fantastic. So obviously that's uh, pretty popular. Congratulations, my friend. Uh, maybe I'll make Mini Maker in Honolulu next year. Hmm. That might be kind of fun. Speaking of fun, we've got our Fun in the Sun correspondent, Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, welcome back to the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Padre. I've uh, almost recovered from my bout of traveling for the last six weeks or so, and uh, just happy to be back in the swamp. Well, gentlemen, we're going to be joined by Steve Gibson later on. He's got a couple of security concerns that he thinks the interweb should know about. But I also do want to introduce one more cast member, Zach. I'm not sure if you've got it in here, but this is Venom. This is the official This Week in Enterprise Tech kitty. That's right, folks. Uh, just in case you ever need to release mayhem into your data center, you, you need a sleeping cat. Folks, let's go ahead and jump straight into the blips. This first one, duh, it's about AOL. Now, thirsty for users who haven't checked their terms of agreement in more than, uh, oh, I don't know, a decade, Verizon has announced that it has agreed to acquire AOL for $4.4 billion by the end of this summer. AOL will become a division within Verizon, and current AOL CEO Tim Armstrong will continue to lead operations. In the deal, Verizon will get several large online content operations, including HuffPo, TechCrunch, as well as more than 2.2 million dial-up subscribers that, some insiders say, will be most likely migrated to DSL or Verizon Files. More importantly, Verizon get, gets AOL's over-the-top video assets, which dovetails into Verizon's push to grab a larger share, share of mobile content-happy millennials. Gartner looks at the big happy elephant, sees slow, steady Hadoop adoption. Hadoop is transitioning from the early adopter stage to the threshold of mainstream use. In a recent query of Gartner Research Circle members, 54% said they have no current plans to implement Hadoop. That means 46% said that they are planning to build a system on the big data cluster database manager. Now, don't expect the market for Hadoop to skyrocket, with over half the respondents saying they will make no investment in Hadoop for the next two years, demand will be flat and muted. In the survey, the skills gap was cited by 57% of respondents as a factor inhibiting Hadoop adoption, while another 49% said that figuring out how to get value out of Hadoop was the problem. Regardless of these issues, experts say that businesses shouldn't be lulled into inaction by the ponderous pace of adoption. 
no one wants to be the last company to take advantage of big analytics. Wah, wah, wah. The broadband industry. New rules already costing it money. The threat of a flood of complaints is making broadband providers file in court to get a stay of the new reclassification of broadband as a common carrier. Seems they don't feel that they want to pay for the infrastructure upgrades necessary to meet the new definitions. The key section of the suit is about the impending rules causing irreparable harm with respect to interconnection as pertaining to negotiations for, negotiations for interconnection contracts. Translated, they don't want to have to cut into their profits to upgrade their systems to meet the new rules. Ah, poor broadband providers. Perhaps if you'd started sooner, this wouldn't such be such a bitter pill to swallow all at once. Well, let's talk about the Internet of Things that shouldn't be on the Internet. The Internet of Things is an unstoppable trend, from cameras that can track our movements to sensors that can track pollution, to watches that track, uh, yeah, our pulse rates. Now, the Internet of Things defies categorization into a nice, neat, nice, neat box. However, some security gurus are united in one universal truth within the Internet of Things, namely that it's a ticking time bomb. An IoT panel, which consisted of former RSA CTO Deepak Taneja, said that the Internet of Things is further stressing IT's ability to keep up with security advancements in network technology, while log Logni in VP Patty Srinivasan, uh, I'm sorry about that, said quite simply, the minute you connect it, there are so many things that you have to think about. Most OEMs spent decades building those products, and honestly, they don't have much software savvy. Still, the ticking time bomb or not, the Internet of Things is here to stay. Microsoft gets cloudy under the sea. This week, Microsoft released details showing that for the last nine months, it's been significantly investing in subsea and terrestrial dark fiber capacity through fiber partnerships that span multiple oceans and continents. Microsoft is now part of an international consortium of telecoms and cable manufacturers bringing 80 terabytes per second, that's eight zero terabits per second, data speeds across the Pacific Ocean and significant multi-terabit per second speeds across the Atlantic. The consortium was first announced in February of 2013 and construction began on Monday. Microsoft certainly isn't alone out there. According to digital marketing consultant Built Visible, as of 2015, there have been nearly 300 underwater cables built in oceans around the world, totaling just less than 680,000 miles of cable. Well, those El Cheapo home routers are really becoming a problem as researchers find self-sustaining botnets consisting of poorly secured home routers. Seems those El Cheapos are so poorly secured that bot herders are simply scanning for them to add to their flock of DDoS zombies. We've been saying for a while now that the attack surface extends to the home router and Dan Gear's prophetic keynote is coming true in spades. Time to upgrade and perhaps help your friends, family, and neighbors update and secure their home routers to do your part in reducing that huge attack surface. If you're a business traveler, Rejoice! Judge Amy Berman Jackson from the U.S. District Court in D.C. has ruled that you don't automatically give up your Fourth Amendment protection from unreasonable search and seizure just by crossing a border. The president was said in the case of Jay Sheik Kim, a Korean businessman whose laptop was seized at the border and its contents searched to gather evidence for a pre-existing investigation. Judge Jackson ruled that while the Supreme Court has opined that the Fourth Amendment protections are reduced at the border, they aren't removed entirely, and therefore there must be some reasonable suspicion of ongoing or imminent criminal activity for a search to proceed. This is a reversal of a 2013 Ninth Circuit decision and a 2014 Maryland District Court decision that dramatically reduced or eliminated the burden of reasonable suspicion. Of course, our audience knows that it's best not to have any sensitive data on their devices while traveling. Well, that does it for the blips. Let's go ahead and move on to the bites. This, this is the one that I've been kind of salivating over for the entire week. Earlier this week, Microsoft announced that they're going under. Well, actually, they're, they're going under the sea. They, uh, they have been significantly investing in an undersea and terrestrial dark fiber plan for the last nine months. Now, this significant investment has included partnerships with fiber owners and fiber layers, as well as the building of a physical landing station in the United States for connecting North America to Asia. Now, these partnerships will include China Mobile, China Telecom, China Unicom, Chenghua Telecom, and KT Corp. 
Uh, Redmond also partnered with both Hiber Hibernia and Aquacoms, which is a big move if you actually look into the history of those companies. Hibernia is known for managing landing stations across the world. They own 24,000 kilometers of fiber assets, and that includes a transatlantic system that was originally laid by Tyco Submarine Systems in 2000 for $962 million. Uh, Aquacoms is a provider of super high-speed cable systems. They use a combination of SDN and transceivers that can send and receive over 130 unique laser wavelengths over a single fiber pair, with each wavelength capable of carrying 100 gigabits per second. Now, all of this means that we should see the, com the first commercial bits pass the new cross-Pacific cable network, which is what they're calling it, in the fourth quarter of 2015. It's going to span about 8,000 to 8,500 mi miles. It will directly connect China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan to the United States, and it will have a capacity of 80 terabytes, not bits, but terabytes per second. Now, we don't have a cost-to-cost -cost comparison, but compare the project to Google's faster system, which is also Trans-Pacific, but will operate at 60 terabytes per second, and it'll be ready in the second quarter of 2016. I want to throw this out to the panel. Let's start with you, Chibert. Why is Microsoft doing this? Well, every time fiber has to transition, unfortunately, if it has to transition, say, through Hawaii, the regeneration systems introduce later at latency and perhaps a little bit of jitter. By going a direct connection, Microsoft can in sometimes carve off you know, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe even 60 milliseconds. And I said milliseconds, not nanoseconds. So especially when you're starting to talk about things like financial transactions, a millisecond is actually a pretty big deal. So just in the high-end commercial traffic, Microsoft is going to make their money back in spades. All right. Speaking of money... We know that Google's Faster is going to run about $300 million for deployment. So obviously things have become much, much cheaper. Uh, Cheaper, you have some experience with what it takes to lay down fiber. You want to talk a little bit about what the process looks like? Well, I'll tell you. <clears throat> In previous generations, the cable laying ship will actually back up into the docks at the factory. So, for instance, um, might be Secor in the Louisiana dock area. The end of the production line is actually on the ship, and they have some old timers that have the knowledge on how to wind the cable in the, in the ship's hold. Now, this ship, ship's hold is massive. It's almost the entire length, of, well, about half the length of the ship just in cable. And that way it unwinds at a very specific rate so that it, the tension on the cable doesn't increase to the point where it breaks the cable. Now, to put the cost in perspective, um, the only fiber that I really know the price on goes from Alaska to the northern island of Hokkaido. So it's a trans-Pacific cable. Um, 15 years ago, that was a $2 billion cable. Now we're talking about a trans-Pacific that's, what, $300 million? That is a heck of a big savings. So obviously the technology to lay the fiber has gotten way, way cheaper. Yeah. And actually, again, if you look at the companies that are involved in this partnership, specifically Aquacoms, uh, it explains why this, this system is actually going to be more expensive than the one that Google's laying. Google's is going to cost $300 million. There are those who are estimating that this is probably about a $445 million project. They're saying Microsoft is probably footing about a third of that because they are actually building the landing station. They're going to be managing the landing station. What's interesting, Chibert, is... They went with Aquacoms because they could dramatically increase the amount of bandwidth that they could push per fiber pair. Now, the faster system for, that Google is going to be using has six fiber pairs. It could, again, it can do about 60 terabytes per second. This one has seven fiber pairs, but it can do 80 terabytes per second. Again, because they're using more advanced transceivers, which is why it's going to be more expensive. Uh, now, Chibert, just kind of off topic. It, it always fascinating me, fascinated me what you have to do if you break your fiber system, uh, the, what, what they have to do to dredge up the two ends and splice them together. Uh, that, have you ever operated with, uh, with a team that was doing that? Yeah, funny about that. Um, the, trans, the, the repeaters on the cable actually can have uh, pingers turned on. So that gives you a sonar signal to be able to home in on. 
there's actually a special sled that the cable laying ship um, drags behind it until it goes and snags the cable. Now, the cable is not run in a straight line. It's run in a big, giant serpentine. That way, there's some extra cable so you can actually pull the cable up onto the deck of the ship to be able to do the repairs because a lot of the electronics don't work at pressure. So it actually has to be in a special container that's one atmosphere. Now, to put it in perspective, the one atmosphere containers for the Aloha Cabled Observatory are 10 feet long, 24 inches diameter, made from a solid billet of titanium, and they cost the project $175,000 each. Keep in mind, a trans transatlantic or transpacific cable needs quite a few of those. And that, that container doesn't include the electronics. All right. We've got Web3423 in the chat room who's asking about earthquakes. And actually, act yes, earthquakes are one of the biggest reasons for cable breaks. Uh, you may remember there was an earthquake off of the coast of Asia maybe six years ago that split four of the major fiber branches that were running uh, uh, across the ocean. Now, as you get closer to shore, you start running into dredging problems. These ships that are dragging something on the ocean, they snag a cable and they snap it. But out in deep ocean, it's, it's probably going to take some sort of tectonic feat in order to snap a cable. Curtis, I want to throw over to you here because let's, let's talk a bit of nitty-gritty. Chebert alluded to this, but why would Microsoft invest so heavily rather than just partnering paying $10, $20 million, million dollars into the pool and get bandwidth. Why would they suddenly want to become responsible for one of the landings for this cable? Well, ultimately, it's all about the cloud. Uh, what Microsoft is trying to do is connect their data centers in these different continents uh, as tightly as they can into one cloud facility. And for Microsoft, being able to control the landing point means that they can make new technology available on their schedule rather than the, rather than the schedule of their partners. Uh, it also means that should things change with their partners, uh, this is an area where purchases of companies do happen. There's no chance of them being held hostage by one of their competitors buying up one of their partners. Uh, so again, for them, it's all about the cloud. It's all about making sure that their data centers are connected and making sure that their cloud is as responsive globally as anyone's out there. Curtis, let's talk a little bit about that because uh, when I tweeted out the story, I got a lot of people who told me, told me, well, this is not really increasing capacity. This is only, as you mentioned, between Microsoft's data centers. They want to make sure that Azure is going to respond quickly, that their customers get served. But it's it's more complicated than that, right? I mean, yes, it, it, they're, they're buying it primarily so that their data centers have, have better access to, to bandwidth that they can control, that they can price, et cetera, et cetera. But that means that all their Azure services, which are public-faced, run more quickly. So this does add to the capacity of the Internet. Oh, absolutely. And it's important to note that the cloud, in large sense, is about responsiveness. I mean, generally, when, uh, when they do an enterprise contract, there will be service level agreements that say that, uh, for example, an application that's running on the Azure cloud uh, will respond to a click, will respond to, to some sort of input within a certain amount of time, uh, usually measured in, in milliseconds or seconds. That is largely geography dependent. I mean, if you are trying to serve someone in Japan and you're serving them from a data center in Washington, uh, you've got a huge latency built in already. It becomes very difficult to fulfill that SLA. You want to have the, op uh, the operation center for the Japanese customers in Japan. With that said, you also want to have elements of the control structures spanning the oceans. You, you want the redundancy to be on another continent. You often want the management to be on another continent. To make it all work, you need as little latency as possible. That comes through speed. And you also want to have it be a very reliable uh, resource that you can use. And that's where the issues of control come in. Microsoft feels very confident 
that they can manage the infrastructure better than anyone else. And so they get to prove that with this new cable that's being laid. I, I do want to throw in one other thing, and, and that's something that we haven't heard about. <clears throat> that's the question of which Microsoft entities are actually paying for the cables. You recall that uh, we've had a lot of discussion in the last year about companies like Microsoft and Apple keeping large reserves of cash outside the United States and, and how they're going to move this around now that different countries are looking at taxing the money. I suspect, although I don't know, that if you dug into it deeply, you would find that these cable ownership agreements are a way of essentially putting that offshore cash to use. That's a way to take some of those large reserves of cash, put them into something tangible, and not have to deal with the taxes involved in simply writing a check from a, an international subsidiary to a North American subsidiary. Absolutely. And we're going to be talking about that in just a bit because this definitely does open up options for the future of Microsoft. But Chibert, I want to go to you to talk a little bit about services because this was more than just a cable across the ocean. And actually, Steve Gibson is in the chat room right now. He's chomping at the bit. He wants people to know that, look, our, our transoceanic fiber is actually really, really saturated. And so anytime you can lay down extra capacity, even if it's from data center to data center, that can release capacity to the other fiber uh, networks. That's always a good thing. But aside from the transoceanic fiber, Microsoft also announced that this grand strategy included buying up or partnering with dark fiber in the United States, which tells me that they're trying to build up not just across the ocean, but within the United States, they're building up their network so that they can connect their data centers to, to data centers on fiber that they control, which is really, that's a model that, that Google and Amazon have really showed uh, is necessary if you want to be a leader in services, yes? Oh, yeah. And, you know, not only that, if you're going to be rolling out, you know, something new like SDN across a WAN, being able to control your your switching systems and your cable systems makes a pretty big deal. Um, Microsoft has already you know baked it into their operating systems, and they'd like to be able to extend that across the oceans. And you know, the other thing too is, gee, if you own the fiber, you can do some really really interesting things. Um, you know, especially because right now they might be having X number of wavelengths of light. All we have to do is have transceivers that work better, and you can double or triple that. We've already seen that just in the last five years. You know, court, uh, wave division multiplexing has gone from, oh, wow, that's really cool that we have two colors of light, to 8, to 16, to 32. You know, now we're having hundreds. If you control the fiber and it's your fiber and you have the right kind of repeaters, you can actually start really increasing the number of band, band um, wavelengths that you can shove down a pipe. Yeah, I remember some of the very early technologies for transoceanic fiber. I was blown away that they could push one terabyte of information per second. That was that was amazing. And now we here we are, not that far later, and we're pushing 60 and 80. So, yeah, the, the, the wave division multiplexing is making a big difference. But let's get oh. to the big strategy question here, because this, this is where we're leading. I have trouble believing that this is a one-off move by Microsoft. I don't think they're just buying this cable, buying some dark fiber, and then they're going to say, well, okay, we're done. We've got our fiber. We've got our data centers. That's it. I see this as an expansion move. The, Microsoft is actually sitting on a big pile of cash, and they're wondering what they're going to do with it. I think this is a great place for them to invest, investing in the infrastructure so that they get the next generation of services that work nowhere near as well anywhere else. Curtis, let me throw to you. What could this do to Microsoft's future strategic developments? Where would you like this to lead them? Well, I, th I think that all you have to do is look at the direction that Microsoft's CEO has said they're going in, and that is the direction of the cloud and of services. I mean, look at it. This is the kind of thing that can lead to not just, say, the Office 365 level of applications, but all kinds of enterprise applications that can be served across these broad networks that they're building. It also makes Microsoft a much better partner 
for the very large enterprises. And and let's be honest, Microsoft has talked about things like in-memory computing, which competes directly with SAP. They have talked about the kinds of software that compete directly with Oracle. What Microsoft is doing in a very real sense is announcing that they are seriously going to compete for the very largest global corporations. Now, you say that that's a small market, and you're right. But the good news for everyone else is that if they can successfully compete for these very large organizations, then the additional services they can offer to smaller corporations sort of gets dragged along. Think of it like our U.S. interstate highway system. Automobiles don't really factor into the design of interstate highways. It's all about the trucks. The good news is that in designing them to meet the needs of the 18-wheelers, automobiles get a pretty good driving surface as well. I think that works really nicely as an analogy for what Microsoft is doing with all these transatlantic cables. Chiebert, same question to you. What would you like to see Microsoft do with all this excess capacity that they're going to have in, what, eight months? <laughs> Actually, what I'd like to see is I'm thinking Microsoft might also be building a secure, clean network that they control, they can secure, that they can then sell customers up that, well, you can have less of a worry of all the crud and so forth on the Internet because you're going to be on a corporate Internet that's cleaner. I don't know if they'll ever pull it off, but it sounds good. Yeah, I'm, I'm all about that. Well, gentlemen, let's go ahead and move on. When we come back, we're bringing Steve Gibson into the conversation. We just spent the last half hour explaining why Microsoft is opening up all this new bandwidth with new fiber networks, new dark fiber, new services. Steve Gibson may give you a reason to swear off the Internet forever. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the first sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech. Now, consider this. If you run a business, your business is only as strong as the people that you hire. That's right, your employees are your true strength. They're the ones who bring experience, who bring productivity, who bring new ideas that make your business what it is. Now, the problem is that the old method of finding the people to fill up your business just doesn't work anymore. You know, you, you post to a newspaper, or maybe, maybe if you're really savvy, you post to a website, and you get a trickle of candidates, a few people who may or may not have the skill set, who may or may not have the proper culture for your company, it's, it's just not enough. In today's age, your company deserves the right person with the right skill set and the right personality, which is why we're happy to welcome ZipRecruiter to the Twyte Riot. Now, ZipRecruiter understands that posting your job to one place just isn't enough to find those quality candidates. That's why they let you post to 100-plus job sites with a single click. ZipRecruiter will help you find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once, and within 24 hours, watch your candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. I'll find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 400,000. That's 400,000 people, businesses. Better yet, because you're a loyal listener of Twyet, you get to try it for free. Do it today. Getting the right people for your company is so important that it's time to do it right, to do it quickly, to do it with ZipRecruiter. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyet. ZipRecruiter dot com slash twiet and we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of this week in enterprise tech we welcome back to the show our security guru the man who i turn to when i need answers mr steve gibson that's right steve gibson from grc.com the maker of shields up of Spinrite, and soon the program that will replace all authentication squirrel steve thank you and welcome back to the program Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. You, <laughs> now, we had you on last week, and I, I wasn't planning on having you back for, uh, for a while. We like to space out our, our Gibson doses. But we had two very interesting stories this week that I thought deserved a security professional. This first one is a doozy. Chibert and I have been following this for a while. There have been several stories that we've covered here on Twyet that talk about some really bad firmware or really bad hardware, just not malicious, but just really poorly made that allowed for an attack on the edge. Now, this, this came up at Black Hat last year with Dan Gear's talk. He was saying, we've so, we focus so much on protecting the core that we've forgotten that if we don't protect the edge, core doesn't matter. If, if I own 
half a million routers on the edge, I can destroy the core with traffic, so I should be protecting them equally. Well, this one comes from our friends over at Encapsula, who have also been on This Week in Enterprise Tech. They uncovered a router-based botnet that is launching DDoS attacks at the bequest of Anonymous. Now, the discovery was made while Encapsula was in investigating attacks being made against their customers. They traced back some ano anomalous traffic and determined that it was coming from routers made by Ubiquity and distributed by customers uh, to customers by several ISPs. So these are these DSL, ADSL routers. These routers all had malware installed on them. In most cases, more than one piece of malware, some of which were taking orders from an IRC channel run by Anonymous. Now, Encapsula doesn't think that the routers were compromised by firmware vulnerabilities, as was the case with more than 700,000 DSL routers that were discovered in March uh, that had a directory tra traversal flaw that exposed administrative and super user credentials. Rather, they think that these devices were all running default usernames and passwords and had their interfaces open to the WAN. But Steve, let me throw this out to you. That's the fault of the ISP. I mean, if these were modems that were given to the customers and they had all that stuff turned on, that's not the fault of the person who, who receives it. Well, that's what's so troubling about this is that, uh, as you mentioned, their, le their latest count is 40,269 <laughs> diff different IP addresses associated with these routers, which are, or they're in the possession of arguably non-technically savvy end users who don't even understand that they have a router. They just said, you know, I want DSL. Uh, do whatever you have to do. Give me whatever I need in order to get DSL. And so this equipment arrives and is installed and, oh, look, they're on the internet. But in the process, there's this box that is the interface between their local network and the global internet, which it turns out is unbelievably insecure. Because as, as you said, it turns out that both an HTTP server and an SSH, an SSH, a secure shell server, are both running with open outward facing ports and default admin uh, logon credentials so that so that anyone who scans the IP that that this internet connected router has been given will discover oh look there's a web server oh look there's a secure shell server and if they then log on to it they can succeed and in fact, use secure shell to execute commands and install malware. So, and, and the problem is, this is not like uh, DNS reflection attacks or NTP server reflection, where you've got you've got, as you said, core-based um, big iron equipment that will generally get itself locked down pretty quickly as soon as it's as soon as it's discovered that there's a problem. These are never going to get fixed unless I, the, I mean the only way I can think of it is if somehow um, some effort is made by sort of a law enforcement branch to go out and fix them through their own management interfaces because you can't contact the end users and say fix your router they don't even know what a router is they just got this hardware which has been taken over. Yeah, that's that's the sad truth. I mean, these are unsavvy people. They don't know that that's a router. They know that's the internet. That's that's right. where they get the internet. The internet comes from that box. That's the box that someone gave me. And oh. uh, don't touch it. You know, it's got <laughs> blinky break. lights. Leave it alone. And, and the sad part is, there's a lot of, of these ISPs who actually do this on purpose because they think they're going to get in and they're going to fix a problem. And as right. a result, they they expose us to things like this. Uh, Cheever, let me throw this over to you. As, as Steve mentioned, this was found on 40,269 different IPs from 1,600 ISPs in 109 different countries. Now, it's, it's strange because the two of us really just heard about this whole protect the edge, not the core thing last year, and it came true so quickly. This was Dan Gear's thing, right? It, it was hackers at some point. These, these people who want to exploit network vulnerabilities are going to realize the core is getting better at protecting itself. Yes, you're going to get big breaches like you had at Sony, Target, or Home Depot, but the core is not where it's at anymore because if I own the edge, I own everything. Oh, yeah, you bet. And 
one of the things that I, uh, I long before Dan Gear's keynote, you know, I've been going around and talking to different people, you know, anyone that'll listen to me and say, hey, um, I actually logged into your firewall. Can I <laughs> do can I fix it for you, please? And, you know, I knew it was running Linux and it was only a matter of time before someone goes and creates a vulnerability. And there's been a whole bunch of security professionals that have been quaking in their boots about this problem for many years, you know, long before Dan Gear said anything. And, you know, one of my favorite things is, you know, I'll log into my neighbor's systems, uh, upgrade their firmware, clean things up, start closing down a lot of ports and then drop instructions onto their home printer giving them instructions on how to change the passwords. Right, right. You know, this is not hard to do anymore. And this is something that, that, you know, we, we need, people need to do it. You, you need to help your neighbors. You know, if you have neighbors that don't know how to do this, for God's sakes, help them out. Be a good neighbor. Help reduce the attack surface. We've got to do it or the internet's going to become unusable. Right. Now, uh, Curtis, I want to throw the good neighbor argument to you because uh, the largest concentrations of these modems were Thailand, 64 percent, Brazil, 21 percent. The U.S. only had 4 percent and India had 3 percent. So I want to talk about what it means to be a good neighbor, especially when neighbor expands to neighbor on the Internet. But we have a couple of people in the chat room. And Steve, I want to throw this over to you. Uh, we've got Web3423. We've got JJ to the 4884 who are talking about well, is there a list of the modems? How do I fix this? You Essentially, I would assume if you have a, a device that you receive from your ISP, just assume that there's something wrong with it. <laughs> uh, what I would always suggest is go ahead and get the latest version of the firmware, update the firmware, and then go into the interface and turn off all external facing uh, management. Right. That's that's step number one. What else should, we, should they be doing? I absolutely want to turn off WPS protocol. That's been shown to be very vulnerable too. That's the protocol that is like sort of the one button pairing or you read the eight digit code from the serial number label of your router. When, for example, you're you're setting up a new system, it says, oh, just give us the eight, not the eight digit pin. That is an insecure protocol. And it's even though it's it's simple and easy, uh, it's constantly having problems. So I so as you said, turn off all WAN the 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 wide area network, the WAN side management. You don't want to expose anything to the internet, and also disable WPS, which is just an, a a poorly designed protocol for for making pairing easier because unfortunately it makes it easier for the bad guys too right which is which is kind of sad and actually i can do you one worse there are, there is a, a cable company in the united states that in one region sell uh, offers modems that you can turn you think you're turning off the wan interface but it doesn't actually turn it off there's a secret mm -hmm. wan interface that is available they say only to the isp but well, we'll talk about that later curtis let me throw over to you about the good neighbor question we want to be good neighbors we don't. We want to respect sovereignty and territorial sovereignty. And the, the law. The law, exactly, the <laughs> law. But this does start to be a problem if you've got all these edge routers that are infected. How do we, in this era, be good neighbors, be good network neighbors, when we start getting flooded with traffic from Thailand or from Brazil? Well, I, I think that the, um, the amount that we can do here in the U.S., to affect what's happening in Thailand and Brazil is pretty small. Uh, you know, basically what we have to do is, is what we've always done to protect against DDoS attacks. Now, here in the States, because, you know, there were in North America a, a smaller percentage of, of these vulnerable devices, um, <clears throat> you're left with a handful of, of options. Um, you can let it casually be known at neighborhood gatherings that you are, in fact, a practiced geek uh, and can help out your neighbors if they have any security concerns. Although I agree with, with Brian, uh, most people who have these, pro these problems don't realize that they have a device that could be a problem. They, they have no idea what this magic box is that they got from the ISP. Um, Another option, you know, we have a couple of, of companies out there and a number of firms where once a month or once a quarter, uh, you can take documents to be shredded. 
uh, it, because that's the, the secure way of dealing with paper documents that have sensitive information on them. Perhaps it's time for one or more of these organizations to start the Let Us Help You Defend Your Home Router. Uh, let us help you make your cable modem more secure. Uh, have those days. Uh, I suspect that there are a lot of ISPs that would scream bloody murder about it, but if they're not going to solve the problem themselves, uh, too bad. Well, gentlemen, when we come back, we're going to have Steve Gibson explain Venom. That's right. You've probably heard about Venom in the news. We're going to be talking about it for the next week or so because either it is the worst thing ever or the tech media has really gotten it wrong. And Steve Gibson's going to clear it up in just a bit. But before we do that, I want to show you uh, the, the routers that Chibert and I both use. We saw this in Interop. We stopped by and said hello to an old friend at the Dell Sonic wall booth. So without further ado, TD, press that magic button. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit here at Interop 2015 in Las Vegas for Twit TV. I'm standing next to, well, he's been on Twiat before, Dmitry Arapatov. He's with SonicWall, now Dell SonicWall. And uh, Dmitry, there's been this thing that's been happening the last couple of months. In fact, last month, the former security czar for the United States came out and said something that's been on the mind of security professionals for a while, and that is the traditional model of perimeter security is dead. What does that mean? Well, I think what that means is uh, it's not just, it's not dead as in we have to throw it away. It's dead as in we really have, it's evolved. It's evolving. It's changing. You have to look at the perimeter, uh, at the network perimeter as being now distributed. It's not just about I have my headquarters and I have a very strong security policy and a firewall at my headquarters, but then my remote branches or my contractors or my executives' homes that are connected with VPN or the other ways to my headquarters have second grade or you know consumer off-the-shelf technology security. So you really have to think of all of those locations as part of your perimeter. And then you also have to extend that perimeter to inside. You have to have segmentation and the same levels of protection between departments. So it's not replacing it and throwing it out, it's evolving it. Uh, we've talked about this quite a bit on Twight, this idea that, well, you know, you can't just trust that what's inside your network, what's behind the firewall is going to be benign. Sometimes you get things behind the wall. Sometimes you get the enemy in the camp. But there's another part of this, and that is in today's workplace, where people will work from home, where executives will have VPNs back so that they can, they can work from a, a remote office, you need to make sure that your perimeter and your zoning also goes outside of a traditional enterprise network. Absolutely. So an interesting example would be is if you use centralized management, for example, to push out policies to your entire distributed perimeter, so you know your big heavy gear plus the uh, enterprise grade little firewalls, what you can do in your executives' homes or again in smaller offices is you can push out automatically, transparently to the users on the network segmentation policy so for example they can have their work wireless network and they can have their kids and family wireless network you can have the you know you guest wireless network for the for the branch office rather than just everybody in the branch office setting up a password one two three shared key wireless infrastructure so it's a matter of pushing out enterprise grade security out to this distributed enterprise everywhere and doing it of course in a manageable way centralized management you know, controllable policies etc and I think that is one of the important keys of this new process, which is you need to start thinking about who needs access to what. It's no longer an, an open network where once you get past one level of authentication, you have access to everything. But another part of that is the actual hardware. What we've seen on a lot of quote unquote multi-purpose security appliances is they just don't have the firepower once you start going for deep packet inspection or if you start having VPNs and VLANs at the same time to, to actually be able to do what they say they can do. One of the things I've always liked about SonicWall, now Dell SonicWall, is your use of the Cavium processors. Those things are built for speed, they're built for packet processing, and you've now made them affordable for those smaller, those segments, those, yep. those remote offices. Tell me a little bit about this, this new series. Sure. So. Um, 
well, I want to clarify. Uh, we've been doing this since 2007. <laughs> you know, this, this is not new. So what's new is that we're refreshing. We're making a generational shift. And the processors themselves are important, and the important part of them is the multi-core aspect. But the real magic sauce, so to say, is in the engine. It's all about the engines. Threats evolve. The way that the threats get into networks continues to evolve. Right now, for example, one of the big trends over the past year and a half has been that threats are moving inside of SSL streams. So now you have to change your engine to be able to not just scan every single packet of every single connection going in and out, but you also have to be able to do that inside of SSL connections on the fly. So that's one of the challenges that we've been dealing with. And this is, uh, you know, this growth in SSL traffic is something that we outlined in our recently published uh, annual threat report. So what we're launching at this show is this new generation of RTZ series. This is the flagship. Uh, this, is, this was the flagship. Now it's just part of the product line uh, series. These are branch and SMB firewalls. Now, one other interesting trend has been that in the past year, Broadband speeds in the United States have already doubled. Now, they, could still, they still have a long way to go, but we're now seeing some competition in the broadband market in the United States. You're now able to get at home or in small business just a regular cable or DSL line that is giving you 50, 100, 200 megabits. Now, if you don't secure that entire bandwidth, then all you're doing is just letting viruses get in faster. Right, again, every single packet of every single connection has to be scanned. And that's what we're allowing with this series. We're, the entry-level device is called the TZ Soho. They range up to the TZ600. This device right here, which is approximately MSRP $1,500, will do half a gigabit of absolutely full deep packet inspection, everything. We will scan every single connection for intrusions, for malware. So if your users are not patching Flash, browsers, OS, which they should be, then this will protect them against the watering hole attacks, phishing exploits, etc. Of course, they can always look up the TZ series. I believe you know, the low end starts about five hundred dollars, and it goes it's actually three hundred three hundred fifty dollars list price, which is by the end of, by the time it gets to the street price, it's around three hundred dollars. And the top of the line, the top of the line tops out at list price fifteen hundred dollars, which list price thirteen fourteen hundred dollars. Dimitri, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Now, could you please tell our audience, if they want to find out more about the TZ series, maybe if they want to test drive for themselves what the interface looks like, where can they go? Well, you can definitely find the inf all the information on sonicwall.com or dell.com under the security section. Uh, these products are primarily available through our channel partners. Our channel partners are security experts. They will help a lot of our customers with, you know, security design, design, secure, uh, design of their secure network, with the deployment of security. So either speak to your channel partner or with your VAR or go online to find more information. One other interesting thing that you should be aware of right now is the transition to 802.11ac wireless. And every one of these devices has a built-in wireless controller that controls our recently launched 802.11ac dual radio access points. So for all of you with new laptops, new tablets, new phones that are 802.11ac capable, you now have the way of not only connecting at those bandwidths, but also securing all the traffic. We've got many more bits from Interop that we're going to be bringing you over the next few weeks, so stay tabbed. Now, when we come back, we've got Steve Gibson. He's going to tell you the skivvy on Venom. Should you be worried about it? What is it? How does it work? And will it end the Internet as we know it? But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the second sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's Dropbox for Business. Now, if you work in the enterprise or even an SMB or a small business, a brick house, you know about the dreaded buy-in. That's right, you find a solution. You find something that should save you time and money, and you need to get your employees to actually use it. Because if they don't use it, it's wasted time. It's wasted money. And one of the biggest buy-ins you're going to get is a way to get your employees to sync and share. Well, if you're using Dropbox for business, you don't have to worry about that buy-in because they already use it. If you are looking for that next generation file syncing and sharing solution, you want to use Dropbox for Business, a solution that over 4 million businesses around the world use because, well, your employees are already trained. They already know how to use it and they already love it. 
Now, Dropbox for Business isn't just Dropbox with business added to it. It includes a lot of extra features that you're going to love if you are in the enterprise. It's that same easy to use, quick to set up Dropbox that your users and employees already love and trust, but they've added solutions for IT. It provides simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any device, and it gives you a starting setting of one terabyte for every user, and it's easy to expand. But for IT professionals, Dropbox for Business also has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing and permission controls, plus complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure that only the right people get access to sensitive company information. Now, Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security and administrative control solutions such as SIEM, DLP, and eDiscovery for even more control. And last but not least, the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data both in transit and at rest, plus segmentation and hashing to anonymize files. In other words, this is the Dropbox for you. Now, these extra security features are also available if you need them. Things like single sign-on, double sign-on, two-step verification. It's, it's all there. If, if you want the next way that you're going to have your team stay in sync, folks, you got to try Dropbox. Now, do you want to give it a try? Because if you do, you can take advantage of your employees' familiarity with Dropbox and sign up for Dropbox for Business by visiting dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash twit. And we thank Dropbox for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's go ahead and move on. We have to talk about Venom. Now, Steve, Venom has made the rounds this week. It was announced early in the week, and uh, it's been a doom and gloom prediction. It was a way to yeah. break out of a VM and perhaps move laterally and cause a lot of mayhem. But what is it exactly? What is Venom? Well, mostly it's a good name. <laughs> um, yes. And this is the problem. If it was just some, you know, uh, uh, a vulnerability number, 32649, everyone would go, huh, what? But you give these things a good name like Heartbleed or Shell Shock, and it gets a lot more traction. So, okay. So, and in fact, in some stories, it's been called, Venom has been called worse than Heartbleed. Um, none of that, I think, really withstands much scrutiny. Um, both Heartbleed and Shellshock were remote trans-internet <clears throat> exploits that were something to worry about. This is a concern probably for enterprise users who may not have control over the processes that are running inside their virtual machine. So let me explain what's going on. Um, when, you, when you have a a normal computer, it's got hardware devices. It's got, you know, uh, LAN adapters. It's got USB controllers. It's got, you know, hardware. And legacy systems have a floppy disk controller. So when you move to virtual machines where, where you're going to have multiple instances of an operating system running each in its own virtual machine, each of those operating systems must be led to believe that it's actually talking to the hardware, just like it would be if it were actually running on, not in a virtual machine, but in a real machine. So the operating system th thinks it sees the LAN adapter, the USB controller, and, for example, a floppy disk controller. It actually thinks it sees the hardware. The way that illusion is created is with a virtual floppy disk controller, which pretends to be the hardware. It intercepts the operating system's access to the hardware virtually and, and emulates its function. So it turns out that 11 years ago, the, the so-called quick emulator, uh, QMU, had uh, an implementation of a virtual floppy disk controller that was flawed. And for the last 11 years, nobody picked up on it. And in fact, um, uh, derivations of QMU, specifically KVM, Zen, and VirtualBox, all inherited this problem that had gone unseen. Other virtual um, 
machine systems. For example, VMware, Microsoft's Hyper-V, and Box you wrote their own code from scratch. So they're not part of this problem. But, but those that were descendants of QMU who were using the of that original 11-year-old floppy disk controller virtualization code, it turns out there's a problem. There, what was discovered was a way for a process running with admin or root privileges to issue some commands to the floppy disk controller, which have not been disclosed. There are specifically two commands out of many that that can be issued, which breaks the emulator of the floppy disk controller hardware in such a way that the that code can break out of the virtual machine containment. Essentially, the idea is that when an OS is in a virtual machine, it's there may be other virtual machines in the same physical machine, but they can't see each other. You assume they're going to be isolated, but but this is in, in, the, in sort of in the same way that uh, with a normal computer, you um, some some code running in a process might be able to break into the kernel. It might be able to break out of its process space. This is like that, but this is sort of up a level where you're able to break out of the virtual machine container and then potentially access the contents of other virtual machines, breaking that, that explicit privacy guarantee. But that's potentially, right? Because this is essentially a buffer overruns. And you're, you're yes. going to be writing arbitrary code, hoping it gets executed. But most, more likely than not, you're just going to end up crashing some of the VMs. Oh, yeah. There'll be a, there'll be a lot of crashing going on. Now, these all, all these things start off with crashing. We, it, it's important to say the vulnerability was found. It was responsibly disclosed. The, the, the people who it was disclosed to didn't believe it at first. And, and, and the guy that, that found it had to, like, pain, painstakingly walk them through a demonstration and make it happen. And then they said, oh. <laughs> so... So the good so we don't have exploits in the wild. As far as we know, this has never been weaponized. It's a vulnerability and the good news of all of this press is that everybody who's who this affects will patch it. I mean, it's probably already done. Right. They're, they're probably in the process of pushing patches out now. So this is the reason that both of us feel that Venom has been overhyped. It's good that the word got out so that the vendors that this does affect, about half of the VM vendors, can fix it. It's not a big deal, but that'll prevent anybody from ever being hurt by it. As far as we know, nobody ever has been. But, uh, but I see this. This was a huge tech press fail. I mean, you don't normally see this. If anything, they underreact. It's like they underreacted to heart bleed. But this was this is doom and gloom. And it you know it only works with with some vendors of VM. And even if you do manage to to do the exploit, you could only break out of the VM. You would probably crash other VMs, and you still had a layer of abstraction separating you from the bare metal. So it would be very difficult to, in, in order to actually turn this into an exploit. And I was impressed by the CrowdStrike guys that, that mm. were the original discoverers of this. They did not overhype it. Right. From what I could see, the press took it as like an opportunity to to create inflammatory headlines and and just use it as clickbait. And so that's basically what we've seen. We have, you know, the press trying to generate some panic where even the people who found it didn't overhype it. Which, by the way, we will be doing for this show. We will be making a title that makes it sound horrible, and then you're going to get to this part of the show, and you're going to realize, no, we actually told you the truth. Let me bring in my co-host really quickly before we run out of time here. Chibert, how closely have you been following Venom, and how quickly did you find out, oh, yeah, th th this is nothing? Uh, I haven't. It's not... <laughs> it's not a thing. You know, <laughs> uh, you know the, the only thing that I have a question on is... I, I need to go and talk to some of the people that, you know, worked on the IPKVM systems that I use from Avocent and Raritan and find out if their virtual floppy drivers um, are, have that same, um, you know, heritage. Uh, I, I doubt it um, because extending virtual media over an IPKVM is a very, very different thing. But, you know, maybe. 
You know, right. but this this is this is well. Why get what's excited? Crazy, what's crazy is that we're talking about a floppy. I mean, <laughs> no. who even has them anymore? The first thing the first thing that occurred to me was, oh, just disable it. Well, it turns out that doesn't quite solve the problem. So remove it. Who who? I mean, I you know, do you do we even need them any longer? It's crazy. Yeah. Actually, I, I got to dis, I got to disagree on that because even if there is no floppy controller or if it's turned off in the BIOS, the floppy driver still exists because that's how a lot of VM systems handle things like um, BIOS upgrades and things like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So and, the driver and, and I will exists. Confess, I do have floppies. There. I've got floppies on my servers because you know they're. I don't know. Well, I, I think I think I, I have one floppy. I have a USB floppy drive just sitting yeah. in a closet in case I need it. But uh, but I, I never would have thought to have attacked this driver. Honestly, uh, what's next? Uh, maybe you can attack the parallel port because most computers don't have a parallel port anymore. Okay, I guess we all agree. Uh, Curtis, I'm let me throw to you really quickly. Now, I I got a lot of panicked emails and phone calls from the different uh, uh, buildings that I've set up with IT. Uh, I've used a lot of Microsoft pro products, a lot of uh, 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 Microsoft and VM products to to set up my VMs. Uh, I'm sorry, VMware, and I had to tell them that no, don't worry about it. You're you're not you you can't be affected by this. Has this hit big in the enterprise yet, or are we still at the hype stage? I think we're still uh, pretty early in what uh, Gartner likes to call the hype cycle on this one. And and I suppose if there's good news here, aside from the, the good news that Steve gave us, it's that this does provide an opportunity for, uh, for the executives who normally don't pay much attention to security to be shocked into paying some attention because of the catchy name. Uh, I can imagine a lot of phone calls going on. Are we protected against venom? And then you can have a dis discussion about why you are and what else you should be protected against. Um, so that's the good news. Um, I haven't really heard any bad news yet, except uh, the possibility that uh, some executives are probably being distracted from looking at their Apple watches by all this talk about venom. <laughs> remember, well, too, rem remember, too, that you... That this requires, this is not a remote exploit. This mm -hmm. is not something exposed on the internet. You have to have a malicious process running in one of the VMs in the first place in order for it to even have, even be able to, even give it the privilege of crashing another VM, let alone exploiting it in some as yet unproven fashion. So arguably there are some people who might be exposed, and those would be people who who rent out virtual machines over the net, you know, like virtual machine hosting providers, because there you're going to get from them a VM, and you're going to be sharing a physical server with other people's VMs. And, and, I mean, for example, some of the interesting exploits in crypto are how can you determine the keys, the cryptographic keys that other virtual machines are using from your virtual machine through the so-called side channel attacks because you're sharing the same processor. And so the idea of sharing a single processor allows potentially some cross virtual machine um, leakage of information. But, but this just sort of, you know, it's like, well, okay, you know, first you've got to have something bad in the machine before there's any chance for something to happen. Exactly. And if you've got someone who has that intimate a connection to your VMs, they're, they've got much easier ways to destroy you than, than yeah. Venom. I think you're right. I think it's just a good name. In fact, if this had been called KB5622-6, I, I don't think it probably would have gotten nearly as much media coverage. Well, actually, there was one called that, and we don't even know what it is. <laughs> exactly. But that was much more dangerous and earth-shattering <laughs> than Venom. Folks, I'm sorry, but you have used up another hour listening to the best dang podcast, Enterprise podcast on the planet. That's according to 9 out of 10 floppy disk drivers. I want to thank our panelists for being here on the show. Uh, let's start with Mr. Steve Gibson. Steve, it is always a pleasure to speak with you. In fact, uh, in June, at some point, I'm going to have a couple of weeks where I get to play with you on Security Now. I, I can't wait for that. But could you yep. please tell the folks where they can find you? We already know I'm that SpinWrite <laughs> is the tool that you must have. If you are an IT person and you don't have SpinWrite, 
there's something wrong with you. You're not doing your job. We also know that they need to go to GRC.com to see your latest and greatest. And we also need that they know, know that they need to keep up with Squirrel because it's going to change the world. But let's find out from you, where do you want them to go to find out more about the Steve Gibson? Let's just rewind this about um, 30 seconds and have everyone listen to you again, Padre, because that was absolutely perfect. <laughs> I, there's nothing I have to add to that. GRC.com is where I live and uh and do my stuff and i've got i've got lots of good stuff there but we have a you know at the top of the screen as a menu system you just sort of hover your mouse around and and discover all kinds of cool stuff there so uh by all means if you're curious go to grc.com and have a look around and by the way i really mean that uh, both lee and i talk about this we both had our experiences of when spin right brought a drive back from the dead so honestly if you don't have that as a basic tool in your it tool toolkit you're missing out. And, you know, I, I will say that the, the surprise for me in the past maybe year has been the stories were be, that are beginning to come in, the so-called testimonials of people whose SSDs have been revived. I, I'm, I was thinking, well, you know, six and it's and it's point versions may be the end of the road because after all, the world's going solid state. But it turns out that that SSDs, very much like hard drives, have had their have had their densities pushed so high that the individual real estate allocated to a bit has become so small that that bit has become unreliable. And it turns out, that, I mean, to my delight, that the that the SSD manufacturers applied the same kind of error correction technology to, against the loss of data that hard drives did decades ago. And so Spinrite's strategy for recovery works on SSDs just as well as it does on hard drives. And, and also SSDs may have a problem with just sort of fading because they're actually, instead of being magnetized domains on a surface, they're little capacitors charged with electrons and they leak. And they leak as a function of temperature. So uh, I, anyway, I think there's uh, they'll, they'll, there will be a spin right seven with some uh, special attention paid to SSD recovery. I, I'm actually glad you mentioned that because I believe next week we're having, having Alan Malventano come onto the show to talk about exactly that 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 report yeah. that came out that talked about data leakage from SSDs. So right, yay, stay tuned. Oh, and, and by the way, uh, yes, that's right, Steve Gibson, SpinRight, GRC.com, go there. Thanks, Padre. Of course, I have to thank my co-hosts, starting with Mr. Brian Chi. That's right, the geek in paradise. Chibert, mini maker, interop. We know you're exhausted, but where can they go to find out more about what you're doing? Actually, I'm going to be on Think Tech Hawaii this afternoon, talking about mini maker fair and how things are going and what can we expect for next year. Fantastic. And uh, remember, you can always follow him on, follow him on Twitter at ADV Net Lab, Advanced Network Laboratory. Let's go to my other co-host, Mr. Curtis Franklin. Sir, it is always a joy and a pleasure to speak with you. Any chance I get, I'm going to take it because it's just so much fun. What, are, what can people expect to find on Information Week Radio this week? Well, as always on Information Week Radio, to, earlier today we had a great discussion of, uh, among other things, a study that says that the average human attention span has dropped below the attention span of the average goldfish. What? And uh, that this isn't so much a problem. What? Uh, go back. In. Yeah, that's right. What? Uh, you can. There you go. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> um, but uh, that's the kind of thing that we uh, talk about every Friday on Information Week Live. Also, Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, we have the return of Interop Radio. That's right, Interop. The event may be over, but Interop Radio just keeps rolling along. And for information on all of that, plus the stuff that I'm going to be writing at Information Week, you can follow me on Twitter at KG4GWA. Gentlemen, thanks to all of you for a fantastic This Week in Enterprise Tech. Again, it is so much fun to geek out with y'all. I also want to thank... You. That's right, the person who comes back each and every single week to watch us, to download us, to listen to us in your car. We want to do something for you. We want to make it easier for you to get This Week in Enterprise Tech on your device of choice. Just go to our show page at twit.tv 
slash twiet. That's twit.tv slash twiet. And not only will you find our entire back catalog, but you'll also find a drop down menu where you can subscribe so that this week in enterprise tech will end up on your iPhone, your iPod, your iPad, your Mac, your PC, your desktop, your laptop, your Android device, wherever you want it. We've got a selection for you so you can get the audio version, the video version, or the high definition video version. We do it because we love you. Also, don't forget that we do this show live every Friday at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. Just go to live.twit.tv. You'll see the pre-show, the post-show, and everything in between. And as long as you're watching live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv? I, I will interact with you. I can see what's going on in your minds by reading that screen right above there. It's, it's part of the experiment that is Twit TV. Lastly, thanks to everyone here who makes this show possible, to Leah, Leo, to Lisa. I, I always want to call them L&L, who uh, let me do this show each and every single week. To Carson, my super producer, and of course to my TD, Eskimo Zach. Zach, where can people find you on the Twit TV network? Yes, you can find me on Twitter at Eskimo Zach. That's Zach with an H. Thanks, Padre. And thanks to you. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise... Just keep quiet.